Come on, Will. <laughs> come on. Willow, come on. Come on up. Come on up. Let's go. Willow, come on. Let's go. Well, hello. Welcome back to Tail Three Cabins. Last week, you watched us bring this camper home and uh, gave JD a little workout. Everything worked out good with trying to put it in its place. But today, I kind of want to go over our experience of purchasing this camper. And today, I want to answer eight hard to find answers when you're looking for your RV. And this is typical of, of many RV manufacturers. So this is a Rockwood Roo, but there's a Shamrock that makes the same exact camper. So the manufacturers out there, there's very few manufacturers and they make a multitude of different brands. So this can apply to a lot of you out there that have Rockwood Shamrocks, um, Geo Pros, Forest River products. Um, you'll, you'll find that the interior is very similar in these, that they use a lot of the same electronics, a lot of the same wiring, a lot of the same features. So what I'm gonna go over is hopefully gonna be helpful to majority of the people out there that may be looking for a used RV or looking for a brand new one. But let's get started while we're here. Um, let's get started right here. So one of the first things that these RV shows when you're walking around, they all have these big signs that say wired for solar, solar on the side. What exactly does that mean? Most of these campers, you'll see it comes with a little port here and they're all gonna say that they're ready for solar, but are they really ready for solar? So basically all this is, is a plug that goes directly to the battery. And that's really about it. Now, we have solar panels on top of the roof and there is a solar controller on the wall in there. And you would think that if I bought some panels and I just plugged it into here, it would supplement the whole system. But that's not entirely true. It does not have anything to do with the solar that's on the roof or on the wall. This is just a direct input towards the battery. So if you're gonna get solar panels and you wanna plug into this port to charge your battery, you're going to need a charge controller to go with those solar panels. And that way it will regulate the power coming into the battery. It's not gonna overcharge it. A lot of little portable um, panels now that come with folded suitcases will come with a charge controller. But you wanna make sure if you do wanna get solar panels and pop, pop it in the side here, and you can set your panels out in the sun while your camper can still be in the shade, you're going to want to make sure that it has a solar controller. The other thing that you want to be very careful of is most of these have an SAE connection, which is similar to like your trickle charger, battery charger type connections. And sometimes the polarity on these are reversed. So you definitely want to get yourself a multi-tester, plug it in here and see which is your positive and negative. And then if you are plugging in solar panels to this, make sure your positive and your negative are gonna be the right polarity when it comes in. A lot of times manufacturers reverse these so they can sell you their own package and it's proprietary to them, but all you have to do is just make sure you have the right polarity. You can buy any panels with a controller and plug it in here. So if you do hook up your multi-tester and see that it is a reverse polarity compared to the connection that you got, a lot of times these will come with a reverse polarity connector on there. So it'd be pretty simple. You wouldn't have to mess with any wiring. If you needed to reverse the wires here, they're really just mounted behind the sidewall. And a lot of times it just has some wire nuts back there and you could simply reverse it. But if you're not gonna go with the manufacturer's offering with this side port, you just wanna be careful to make sure your polarity is correct. So when we were out searching for a trailer, we could not find this model anywhere to do a walkthrough. We went to different dealers we called around we looked at inventory within about a hundred mile radius of where we live and there was nothing so we basically had to order it kind of sight unseen now we did walk through other trailers that had similar layouts um, and similar features and functions with the same sort of decor and everything but we couldn't exactly find this exact model so it wasn't easy to get a lot of our questions answered We'd do emails back and forth. Sometimes it'd be a lengthy time before we get an answer. And sometimes we would stump them and they weren't sure. So one of the things I asked is, what kind of battery does this come with? And they said, well, it's a deep cycle battery. And that's about all of the answer I got. And well, what does that mean? I know a deep cycle is a lead acid battery, but how many amp hours is it? So after we got it, I did a little research, looked up the model number, and it's an interstate marine battery. So it is a deep cycle lead acid battery and it only has 64 amp hours. And most lead acid batteries, you cannot take below 50%. So in reality, it only has 32 amp hours for us to use. And well, what does that give you? 
If you convert those amp hours into watts, I basically have 384 watts. In one hour, if I used 384 watts, I would have used the capacity of this battery and I'd be done. So what does 384 watts an hour mean? Well, it doesn't mean a whole heck of a lot. If we had to dry camp, let's say we're going to pull into a Cracker Barrel or a Cabela's or a Walmart because we're in the middle of our trip and we want to get to a certain destination, we got a couple days to get there and maybe we don't want to find a campground each time. So maybe we want to stay overnight in a Walmart parking lot, but let's say we had to run the heater. We would probably not make it through the night on that 384 watts. Even though the heater's propane, it still runs a fan and the fan pulls amperage. If you have a few lights going on, if you try to charge your devices overnight, we would probably take that battery to below 50%. So all in all, your battery is really only good for getting your slides in and out, your overhang in and out, and raising and lowering the front of your RV and you really want to use the rest of it sparingly. 384 watts in one hour is not going to get you too much luxury when it comes into the electricity side of things. So that was another thing that we you know didn't know until we got it and, and started looking into what we actually got when it came to the battery. Okay so let's talk about unknown hidden storage. You can go on YouTube and you can find tours and walkthroughs of just about any trailer out there that you're interested in purchasing. And they'll open up all the doors and drawers and you can see you know what kind of storage that it has but is there hidden storage that they just didn't show you or you didn't know about or maybe they don't consider it as storage well we kind of did find some more storage that we didn't realize that we had so this is supposed to fold down into a bunk and this was screwed shut but there is an access panel under here there's a drawer down here that gives you space for storage but then when you look, that drawer is not as long as this bench is. And we took out a couple screws and we can take this panel off. And in the back there is probably almost double the storage of that drawer. And there's a few little wiring items back here. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about those wiring items when I get to outlets. But on each side of the bunk, there's a, a good amount of storage that we didn't realize that we had that could be useful when it comes to um, items that you don't normally need every day, but it would be nice to have with you. So maybe an additional sleeping bag or two if you get guests that are uh, unexpected, or if you wanted some extreme weather clothing, or maybe some extra bedding. So nice that this is here, but it was never discussed or talked about. The size of sleeping areas, the two bump outs on each side, they're 60 by 80. That's pretty much a no brainer. It's the size of a queen size bed. But then when it talked about that you can fold down the table here and make this a sleeping area and the couch behind us, I really didn't have any clue exactly just how big this was and who could sleep there. Could I sleep there if we didn't want to pull out the bunks? Is it comfortable for me? I'm six foot two. Or is this more for small kids? And in the floor plan or schematic, it says it's a 42 inch table, which this is 44 inches. And this is 26 inches but again since we weren't able to walk through it this was a mystery to us because it might be easier for us to make this into a bed and this into a bed temporarily while we're in transit just for a quick overnight let me convert this into a bed i'm 6'2 and we'll see how well i fit again i'm 6'2 so if i wanted to sleep front to back it's probably a no-go no -go. but if it's just me which it would have to be. I could probably sleep on an angle. And it might not be the most comfortable sleep, but I think it'd be doable. And just to give you some measurements, 44 by 70. If you're under 5'10", you should be okay. Six feet, gonna be at an angle. Six foot two, you're gonna be at an angle. I don't think if you're any taller than six foot two that this would work for you. Okay, pretty much the same deal with the couch also. We knew it folded out, but we didn't know how big it was. We didn't know if we'd be able to handle somebody that's 6'2", so let's check it out. So this would probably be a little bit better for me being 6'2". My feet are hanging over just a little bit, but if we just wanted to stay overnight somewhere really quick, we didn't want to bump out the sides, this would be okay for me. I don't know if Karen and I could both fit on here comfortably, but she could definitely fit over there, I could fit over here, and the dog will pick and choose where she wants to go. 
Okay, the slide. Let's talk a little bit about the slide. If you see right now, there's a gap right here. And as I pull it in, got the slide in. And another question I had that um, they weren't sure how to answer was, if you had the slide in, should you use it? Should you sit in these seats when the slide is in? And if you look down here, there's a little gap underneath the floor. And what I'm told is basically what I found out is that this trailer is new. There shouldn't be a lot of loose screws or, or anything coming loose on it just yet. So it's probably okay to sit or temporarily step here. But if I step on it, this gives an itch. It shakes a little bit. It doesn't feel entirely solid. And where it might pose some danger or hardship is if a screw came in loose or something rolled under here that was sharp or a piece of some sort of metal, the nail started popping through and you stepped on this, you could poke the flooring down below it. And if that sharp object sticks into the flooring and you go to open this slide, you could tear a nice slit in your floor. The odds of it happening are probably not that great, but it is very possible and it's more possible as your RV gets older. To me, I would use caution. I would think I would just slide this out. It's pretty easy as long as you got the space and use it and pop it back in and not take that chance. From time to time, you can go on the outside and look underneath to see if any screws are coming loose or you can lift this carpet up in here and go down and look and see if anything's come loose or if anything is slid under there and that would be a good thing to check just prior to retracting outlets the number of outlets in here exactly how many are there there was no way for us known when you watch little walkthroughs online they really don't cover it you can kind of see them in the background and you're kind of like looking or at least i am like is that a wall plate there or is that something else so just how many outlets are in there, so let's find out. We have one here by the front bump out. There's two USB ports below there. If I pop this door open, there's an outlet there for the TV, so that's two. I look underneath the seat there, there's an outlet, there's three, four, five. This is by your coffee maker outlet. Six, seven. There's another outlet on the wall there, eight, nine, ten. So there are a total of ten usable duplex outlets. And I say usable because when I popped that vent seat open and found that extra space back there, I saw two wired outlets, two duplex plugs that were wired and facing towards the couch that you can't get into and use but they're there i got a flashlight and looked and there's a plate and there's two outlets there maybe if you use theater seats or something of that nature maybe those would be exposed but there's two more outlets that you can't use so a total of 12 but 10 you all right so if you have a lot of devices in addition to the 10 ac outlets you also have eight usb ports throughout here for example this lamp here has a usb port right here mounted a little reading lamp and they're all on the 12 volt system. So they're always on, whether your inverter's on, your Shoreline's on, or just the battery. You're always gonna have power to these USB ports for your device. Now ours came with a 30 amp solar controller and we opted to get two solar panels on top. They're 190 watts each for a total of 380 watts. Along with that solar panel kit came a 12 volt fridge. So the fridge only runs on 12 volt and basically that battery supplies the power to the fridge if you have it on. So I told you that that battery doesn't accomplish very much. The solar panels does power the battery and right now there's 5.1 amps coming in from the sun. We're kind of in a shaded area here with a lot of trees around us. So those solar panels are never going to give us 380 watts, especially being flat on top of the roof, unless you angle them with the angle of the sun. But they help keep the battery topped off. And we're looking at probably changing the battery in the future to give us a few more amp hours, actually quite a few more amp hours. And we might change the inverter. I'll talk about the inverter in a second. But basically, this is a 30 amp controller. It can handle up to 600 watts of solar panel. So we have 380 watts on the roof right now. We could add another 220 watts. You could probably go a little bit over that because you're never fully getting what those solar panels are rated for. So if we enlarge our battery to, and we're looking at maybe 200 amp hours, 
Um, we would have the solar panels up on the roof and I would probably supplement those with that solar on the side cord. That would be a lot of solar panels out on the ground in the sun. But we're looking at just getting a couple auxiliary solar panels to lay out in case we have this in the shade and we want to charge our batteries. So this system really is, is nothing major or huge. It's really just to maintain what battery that it comes with and you could probably enlarge that and you could probably go to a larger battery but this system is not going to handle something that if you wanted to add a bunch of Battleborn batteries and a large battery bank um, you're going to have to update this controller. Uh, it's not going to run air conditioning it's just going to run smaller appliances it'll do the TV just fine and all the lights just fine it'll do the furnace because the furnace runs majority on propane fuel and the only thing you're running is the fan off the furnace and maybe an igniter. Can't do the microwave. The microwave will not run off of this inverter setup or battery setup. Along with the solar kit comes a thousand watt inverter and all the outlets run off of the inverter that I can tell. They're all labeled and they say that they're inverter capable. A thousand watts on the inverter, well what does that get you? Well this is a 12 volt fridge so that's going to stay on 12 volts no matter what. Um, the microwave is not going to run off of a 1000 watt inverter. Most microwaves are around 1500 watt. The TV, the TV should run just fine on the inverter. The entertainment system should run okay. There is a little fireplace down here that's got a built in heater to it. And I don't believe that that's going to run off the inverter. In fact, we could test it right now. No, it's not wired. It is not wired into the inverter. 1000 watts is not going to get you a lot. It's not going to run your air conditioning. It's not going to run the microwave. It's not going to run a coffee pot. There are some coffee pots that might run under the 1000 watts, but they're kind of hard to come by. I've checked in a lot of different Keurigs. No Keurigs will run under 1000 watts. So if you want to make coffee in a trailer like this, you're going to need a generator or you're going to have to up that inverter, which means you're going to have to upgrade your batteries. Okay, and then lastly, a lot of dealers offer like a welcome package and we had to kind of delay the things we wanted to purchase for this. We thought we would make a lot of purchases ahead of time. We knew it was going to be about a five month wait before our trailer was going to come in. So we wanted to start purchasing things ahead of time and we knew in the invoice it said a welcome package. So we weren't sure what was in that welcome package. When I inquired to the dealer, they just kind of gave me a short email back saying that you know it has some hoses and this and that and um, just things to help get you started. So we didn't want to purchase a lot of things right off the bat not knowing what was in this welcome package because we didn't want to repeat our purchases. But in our welcome package we ended up getting the uh, sewer drain hose which was 10 feet with an additional 10 feet so a total of 20 feet. It had a pressure water regulator it had a water filter for the filter system. It had some water treatment chemicals for the gray and the black tank. Um, it had a spatula for the grill that it came with outside in the outdoor kitchen. It had a short garden hose for the side, I want to call it like a side sink area, even though it's just like a spigot by the outdoor kitchen area. It had a 30 amp electric cord with a 110 adapter. So we can plug into our house on the side of the garage here with the 110 adapter run the 30 amp cord over to the RV and put power into here. As long as we're not using everything and don't go crazy, we're not going to trip the, the breaker inside the house. So that's what came with our package. Yours might vary, but just to give you an idea of, you know, when we picked this thing up, what it was going to come with and that we didn't want to repeat anything. Still a lot of things that we have to buy after the fact, and I might cover that in another video, but that's, that's what came with the welcome pack. So I hope that helps you out in your search of an RV, whether it's a used one or a new one. Like I said, a lot of these are all alike. They just have a little different floor plans, but they use a lot of the same innards. Hopefully that gives you a little bit of insight, answers some questions that are hard to find on the internet. And we still have a lot of questions uh, that need to be answered yet too. So as time goes by, we start making modifications, we change out the battery, we go to lithium ion. How's that gonna work with the solar? Um, our inverter, if we're going to upgrade the inverter, what do we need to do to do that? Um, can we still charge lithium ion batteries through the shoreline? There's a lot of questions that still need to be answered as we start making our modifications. And from time to time, I'll come back and pass along that information. I appreciate everybody watching. Hope you enjoy and subscribe to these videos. And, well, keep an eye on us. Take care, everybody. Come on, you got it. Come on. That's a girl. Go on. Oh, good job. No, no, no. Yeah, what is this? What's up with this? It's all right. We're going to hang out here for a little while, okay?